Well, back, I think it was around 1998, I was traveling to Geneva on business to meet a fellow named Tommaso Casarella, an ex-Italian race car driver, pretty flamboyant sort of fellow. But I had to, in order to save money, I had to route through Paris, and I thought, well, I'll meet a vendor there, maybe do a little sightseeing. But unfortunately, in the hustle and bustle, I forgot to pack a coat, which is not a huge deal, right? But this was the coldest winter in Europe in 40 years. So when I arrived and realized I was missing it, I thought, well, no problem, the hotel's warm, I'll just go to the shop in the morning, and hey, what a better excuse to buy that wool black overcoat that I've always wanted in Paris, right? But by the time I got on the tubes the next morning, I realized it was too late. You see, for as irreligious as the French are, everything is closed on Sundays. I mean, everything. And all I had was a light shirt, and I'll promise you, you do not last long when it's in the 20s or 30s. I was left out in the cold. I was not prepared to endure. Now, why do I give that illustration? Well, that's what we're going to see in chapter 25 here. As we've gone through the Olivet Discourse, we've learned a lot. We know that the disciples have asked a question because Christ has responded to the beauty of the Jerusalem temple complex that one stone will not remain upon another. Their understanding then is if Israel and its capital, Jerusalem, is to be destroyed, well, then it must be only at the end of time when the Messiah comes to reign, when He comes to judge. So tell us, Master, when will this be? And when will be the time of your coming? We answer that this is basically the same question, according to their understanding. And then Christ seeks to shepherd them through in chapter 24 and says, hey, don't be alarmed. Don't be misled by false teachers. Don't be misled by false prophets. Don't be rattled when you see earthquakes and hear wars and rumors of wars. Because those are merely, what? Birth pains. And birth pains are not always quantifiable. I know Janice will tell us that because she just spent a long time in labor. All we know is that it's coming. So don't be rattled. But when you see the abomination of desolation, and we said whatever that is, when we go back to, to Daniel, that it is the willful power grab of a leader who's built confidence with God's people and then sought to, through idolatrous, blasphemous act, to persecute God's people. When you see this, whatever it is, know that the end is near. And so we might say, hey, things are going to get worse, but when they get really bad, when you see this, know that our king's return is near. And last week we left off and he said, so be ready. And he gave us the illustration that we're to be ready, much like a household manager. A steward is ready. He's always ready for his master's return. If his master returned now, he could have dinner on the table in 30 minutes. If his master returned now, he would see that the crops have been harvested, that the house is in good order, that his money has not been squandered, that the slaves are not drunk, that he is in an orderly fashion. In real terms, the house steward lives for his boss, his master. He lives to please him. So he said, be ready. He's going to build on that this week. And in chapter 25 here, we're going to see something beyond be ready. We're going to see what appears to be a subtle unpreparedness, but in reality is arrogance. It's an arrogance of thinking that shows itself in a, I can handle it. Or like I thought when I was in Paris, well, this is not a big deal. I'll just go down the street and buy one. Christ is going to show us the consequences of our unpreparedness if we identify with some of these ladies in this parable. The question for us to consider today is, are we prepared to persevere, even if it means a longer and more difficult time than what we expect? Let me say that again. We've heard that we need to be ready. Christ is going to build upon that this week, and He says, but are you willing to still be ready? Are you prepared to last if it takes longer and if it's harder? 
That's what's often missed in the exposition of this passage. The title of our sermon, Prepare to Persevere. And as I mentioned, I don't think that uh, this is talking to just uh, Israel or just Jews at the time. He's talking to his disciples who are about to go out, fulfill the Great Commission, plant churches. So I think this is a timeless truth for us. Christians are not going to escape persecution. We're not going to escape trials. We may not understand exactly all the order of events, but we would be naive to think that we're going to miss out on the trials and tribulations that are to come. And so therefore, we need to prepare to persevere. Let's dive right in. Look at the first verse of chapter 25. Remembering that in the original manuscripts, there are no chapter breaks. So it's going to flow right through from chapter 24 to chapter 25, verse 1 of chapter 25, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. What is then? Well, look back with me, chapter 24, at a couple of verses. Verse 42, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day the Lord is coming. Verse 44, for this reason you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not think he will. Verse 46, blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Then is his coming. It's what we call the parousia, his appearing. This triumphant return where the king comes to rescue those whom he has made righteous and judge those who remain in rebellion. The shout of a trumpet, the voice of an archangel. Jesus Christ is going to come with great pomp and circumstance. Parousia described uh, an emperor's coming, a great dignitary, a head of state, and how they would make way with those who would herald, marchers, uh, men with standards, trumpets, chariots. They would mint coins as to the day of His arrival of his parousia. That's what then is talking about. Now, do we know when that's going to be? No. Verse 36 has already made that clear. But are we prepared should he delay? This morning, I want to do something a little bit different. Rather than just breaking this text apart like I normally do, I want to make observations of these girls, of these ladies. There's going to be a lot of similarities, and then there's going to be a difference. They're waiting for their bridegroom. And in making these observations, we will be able to start making immediate application for ourselves. We will be able to make immediate application as we prepare to wait on our groom. They're simple observations. You're going to say, hey, Brown, this is not that much of a rocket science. But they're profound when we understand what their meaning is for us today. Now remember with the parable, a parable is meant to convey one truth. So don't try to find symbolism in each and every thing. Let's go ahead and just dive right in. First observation, number one, all have accepted the invitation. Let me begin by explaining what a Jewish wedding looked like. Now what's interesting is that we don't have a lot in history, in archaeology, written about weddings in the ancient Near East. And I like what one commentator said. He said, well, why would you? Everyone knew what a wedding was like, right? No one thought to write it all down. But we can can piece things together. We know what our weddings are like. And even from culture to culture, there's a lot of similarities. I mean, we've had some weddings around here lately, right? And they have some of the same ingredients. Though the, the dress and the food and the dancing may be a little bit different based on origins of Cambridge or Dallas or... Delhi or, or, or Goma, right? But the patterns are about the same. There's a, there's a short sermon. Some of you wish it was shorter, but it's short, all right? There are vows. Uh, there is the pronouncement. And then there's a great party, right? And a honeymoon. Within four to five hours, even including a big reception, you're done. Not so in the ancient Near East. It would begin at the bride's house with the fathers coming together and negotiating a contract. This would result in a formal engagement, a promise to marry that was as good as done. In fact, 
when that contract was signed and the engagement began, you were as good as married. Though you hadn't had the ceremony or the consummation of the marriage, it would take a divorce to pull it apart then. In fact, if the husband were to die during this time of engagement, she was considered a widow. And if you look at Luke chapter 2 and we see Mary who was with child, this is the period of their marriage. They were engaged. They had not come together yet, either for, we know, for the consummation or for the ceremony. So a promise has been made. Then the son would look at his future bride and say, I go to prepare a place for you. He would go and build rooms often onto his father's home or secure a place to live. He would spend the better part of a year establishing a business and making sure he could provide for his future wife. At an unspecified time, and usually at night, the groom and his party, his groomsmen, would come for the bride and the bridal party. It was unannounced, and it was in a very public manner. Lots of fanfare, there would be a a parade through the streets, and when they would get them, they would make a big processional back to often the ceremony. But the main event was, watch this, the marriage feast. And this wasn't just an hour or two or five reception. This would oftentimes last a solid week, even two. Can you see why they ran out of wine? At Christ's first miracle at his wedding, at that wedding. Well, all this sounds very familiar to us as Christians. All of this sounds, wow, Christ has used this, but now that I understand what it was really like, there's, there's almost a deeper meaning here going on. Because there's so much preparedness, there's so much readiness that needs to be done. There's so much in the way of leading up to this great marriage feast. In light of that, now look at verse 1 again of chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. That means they gathered at probably the bride's house for the wedding festivities, which would last a week or more. Here, we know Jesus is the bridegroom. And the ten virgins, they are those who profess Christ and they're waiting for Him to come home. Waiting for Him to come get them and take them. Now at this point, as I mentioned, they've all been invited. That's a similarity. There's no difference in the ten. They've all accepted the invitation. They're all committed to attending the wedding feast. If we were to contemporize this, we might say it this way. All have been presented the invitation of the gospel all have accepted the gospel. They believe Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he was going to do. They would claim to be Christians. They would call him their Lord and Savior. They plan on going to heaven and they're looking forward to it. Now look at our second observation. All are in the wedding party. Verse 1 again. Who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Not only have they accepted the invitation, they're actually there together waiting. But why would you need lamps? Well, the word lamp here is different than what we see in Scripture when we think of you know, a, a, either a lamp stand or, or something that is maybe sitting on a desk. We would describe these as torches, rags soaked in oil wrapped around a stick for the purpose of guiding through streets, the dark streets. Now, it was a privilege and, watch this, a responsibility for the bridal party to escort the groom to his home. I mean, it was, it was a major part of the wedding. You know, you had the contract on one end, you got the feast on the other end, but it was this processional was a big deal. And it was, it was these ladies that would get to be part of it with their torches. They would escort the groom to his home and to the wedding feast where it would take place. Now, the torches are necessary if you want to be part of this grand processional. If you don't have a torch, you don't get to be part of the event. You're a party crasher. If you weren't part of the event, you don't get to go to the feast. It's all connected. And so in verse 1, here's what we know. 
They've all accepted the invitation. They're all gathered together at someone's house. They're part of a community of people who profess to be going to the wedding. We might say it this way. They're part of a community of believers. They go to church. They're part of a church. And they're not just part of a a church together. They're part of a church that professes Christ, that preaches the Word of God. They even have their torches looking forward to going to heaven. Look at our third observation, another similarity. Verse 5. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. Now we don't know why there's a delay here. The fact is is that it doesn't matter. Some commentators have suggested, well, there's problems in the negotiations or or this, that, and the other. It's not the point of the story. The point is that there is a delay. It goes well into the night. And all ten get sleepy and nod off. Now, there's no wrong in any of this. This is not a bad thing. In fact, to bring it into the 21st century, life goes wrong on while we wait for our Lord. You know, there are rhythms of life. There's work to do. Sleep is a normal part of it. No context here says this is a bad thing. All of them rested while they waited. Paul addresses this to the, uh, the church at uh, Thessalonica. You had a lot of people that just put their life on hold and were waiting for the Lord to come back. Sold their businesses, were sitting around, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and to eat their own bread. Paul talks about uh, in, in his uh, second chapter of 1 Timothy to lead a godly and disciplined life. We don't just go up on a mountaintop and just wait for Jesus to come back. No, life goes on. And so, so far, all these girls look the same. They've received an invitation. They've accepted it. They're part of a community that says they believe in Jesus, and they're waiting for Him. They even have the normal routines of life, but there's a difference. Only some brought extra oil. The one singular difference is described as wise. And those who didn't bring it are described as foolish. Look back at verse 2. Five of them were foolish. But don't, don't just gloss over that. When Christ uses the word fool or foolish, it's pregnant with meaning. It's heavy, heavy. It's condemning. He didn't say five of them were ignorant or or, or even sloppy or even absent-minded. He says they were foolish. And five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now a torch with an oil-soaked rag, has a, uh, about a 15-minute burn time. And we can assume that coming to the bridal party, the bride's house, that they had all soaked their rags and they were ready to go. But some brought extra flasks, just in case that groom was delayed. And let me explain this in terms of camping, you might understand, because you kind of read this, and you're thinking, I, I don't really get it. Or we you just have some people who are like, OCD and super prepared, and these people weren't thinking about it. Well, let me explain it this way. Think about camping. Okay, I'm not really a camper, but just hang with me, all right? One time in 25 years have I been camping with my family for one night, and that was my fill. But when I was a kid, my folks loved it, my family loved it, and we had this old uh, Coleman lantern. You remember those times? You know, make noise, and you put oil in it. Well, you needed the Coleman lantern if you were ever going to leave camp and go on a hike, and you needed to cook something you caught or, 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 or camp out from the campsite. You, you needed something more than a flashlight. You needed a Coleman lantern. 
And so we would fill this thing up and we would say, okay, you know, this is ready for the hike. But invariably over the next few hours, someone needs it to go to the restroom for a couple of minutes. And someone decides they can't find something. And then someone wants to use it to play a game. And it's only a minute or two here and there, but we start to burn through that oil. And so when we go on the hike, someone grabs the lantern, thinking we're prepared. We get to the place, we've caught our fish, and it won't stay lit. And so it is with these ladies. They've got their oil-soaked flashlight, home and lanterns from the first century. Someone goes to the restroom with it. Someone goes to take a short walk outside. Someone has dropped something, they need to find it. And these minutes burn away. Now watch what happens in verse 6. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Now I've heard it described that as the groom and his party would get near that they would, they would just yell out with a shout. Whatever it is, they know that in the stillness of the night, they see light coming. Maybe it's two miles away. And they hear the voices and they recognize them. And someone arises from their slumber and turns around to the other nine and says, he's here, he's coming. And quickly, they're grabbing their torches the Greek says literally they were putting them in order, which means they're, they're, they're trimming the edges. Someone grabs a, a light, and they start, they start trying to light one after another, after another, after another. They all get lit, and what happens in verse 8? Ah, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. In real time, in present tense, you sense that they're looking at their torches, and they're just smoldering. They're starting to go out. Instead of catching fire and being, you know, large and bright, they're just smoldering. And they panic. Reality sets in. Remember, if you don't have a torch, you're not part of the party. You don't get to be part of the processional. If you can't be part of the processional, you're a party crasher. You're not allowed. If you don't go as part of the processional, you won't be able to make it to the party. They realize all this, and they panic. But then they, they think, hey, it's okay. I'll just borrow some oil. But in verse 9, the five bridesmaids who brought oil said, we can't. It'll ruin it for all of us. If we share our oil with you, we won't even make it halfway. If the processional doesn't go on, well then the wedding is off. I'm sorry, we can't help you. You need to go buy some at the store. Now, I don't imagine that at midnight the Jerusalem hardware store is open and Walmart wasn't going to come on the scene for another 1,900 years. So some shopkeeper is getting wakened up. We need some oil. Help us out. Five panicked women who spent a lot of money on their dresses, by the way, and want to be there. Open up. Give us some oil. Now, take a step back here. What's going on? Why is Christ so willing to call them foolish? Why is Christ so willing to paint them in a light that seems kind of harsh? What about these other bridesmaids? Why wouldn't they share a little bit? Well, let's take a minute and just analyze the thinking of these foolish girls. The reason I state it that way is that we always want to let our hearts and our minds align with Scripture rather than stand in the place of God and judge it. I was looking at this, and it seems to be an unrealistic understanding of time on their part with regards to preparedness. They seem to either think that what they have will last until He comes, or... They can borrow what's not theirs or there'll be time to go get some more. These three scenarios seem to maybe overlap, but this is what they're thinking. We might sum it in, in two ways. I'm going to have time or I can borrow what I don't have. Okay? I believe the groom is coming back. I want to go with him. Contemporary terms. I believe in Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, I believe he died on the cross. I believe he's God. I believe I'm a sinner. 
I prayed a prayer. I walked an aisle. I did all this. I believe he's coming back. I want to go to heaven. Who doesn't? Does Kenny Chesney say everyone wants to go to heaven? No one wants to go right now. They're saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go. But I'm not prepared. Let's look at this second one first. I can borrow someone else's. I can borrow someone else's. Remember what this parable is about. It's about building upon readiness. It's building upon readiness in a sense of what I mean by readiness is not just looking forward to Christ's return, but being prepared to endure in the event it's delayed or it's harder than I thought. Remember those two things. Can perseverance be achieved based upon a past commitment, a past emotional experience, or just a future desire to go to heaven? We have to answer no. Both of those are good things, but that does not help you persevere in the moment. What do I mean by persevere? Christ has just talked about how it's going to get bad. When he says persevere, this doesn't mean, oh, I just got to wait a long time. What he's talking about is persevere, bear up under persecution. Persecution that lasts, that grinds, that is difficult. You say, what do you mean persecution? Am I, am I talking illness? No, persecution for His name's sake. That's why you're going to be persecuted. Loss of friends. Loss of reputation. Rejection by family. Loss of career because you don't comply with what the politically correct corporation now wants out of you. What Christ is talking about here is that this is not just an, uh, a, a naivete of forgetting oil. This is those who thought they could do other things and that they would have enough oil in their tank to last and the flame won't stay lit. These foolish girls thought, well, I'll just rely on someone else's resources. One commentator writes, the second surprise is to discover that there are some things you cannot borrow. You need to possess them for yourself. It is simply not possible to rely on anyone else for them. Holiness is one of those things. It cannot be traded. If you are not who you profess to be, no one else can help you or stand in for you. The bridegroom will come and it will be too late. You can't share readiness. You can't share perseverance. You can't just be buddy with someone who is walking with the Lord, knows their Bible, is desperately dependent upon the Lord and say, well, yeah, I can be over here in worldliness and I'll just borrow what he's got. So how do we persevere? If we can't borrow it and we have to own it ourselves, what does it mean to persevere? Well, we know what it's not. Perseverance is not just gutting it up yourself. It's not just muscling through, chin to the wind, I'm going to be a tough Christian. No, it's not. If Scripture makes it clear that faith is strengthened by the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to strengthen our faith, then perseverance comes through knowing His Word better. I don't mean just memorizing verses, but that's a part of it. But knowing His Word better means knowing Him better means being desperately dependent upon Him. And it is the Word of God that helps us persevere through the long night. Let me put some flesh around this. No one knew this better. No one understood their, their desperate need for, for God to help them persevere other than King David, right? And if you read the Psalms, you can hear what David attributed his perseverance to. His perseverance when he's on the run from his demonic father-in-law. When he's on the run because his son has betrayed him. When he's being attacked. Psalm 119, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. And then in the same chapter, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. David understood that he couldn't borrow the perseverance needed to last. So too, we as Christians, 
We can't borrow perseverance. We can't borrow holiness, what is not ours. We can't borrow an understanding of the Word of God that we've hidden in our heart that we might last until He comes. But neither will we have time to get ready when He does arrive. Look at our fifth observation. Only the prepared were able to enter. Verse 10, And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. What's that a picture of? Does another verse come to mind? Revelation 19.7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can't accept the invitation. You can't say, yeah, I want to be there. Yeah, I believe. I can't just hang out with other people who say they're faithful, but not be ready to go and be with the groom. Now, hear me out. I'm not in any way talking about a works-based salvation. What I'm talking about is that genuine faith works. Genuine salvation will show itself in a Christ-honoring life that is following Him, ready for Him, learning His Word, desperately dependent upon Him, so that when the waves of persecution come, though we are buffeted, though we are hit, we are able to stand firm on His Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got oil in the tank, you might say. Verse 10, And the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came and said, Lord! Lord! Open up for us. And Christ calls them foolish. And if you want to put this in perspective, something will help you understand why their acts of omission are deliberate. All, all you have to do is go back to chapter 7. You don't need to turn there. But tell me if you don't recognize this. And it's a parallel understanding of those who are wise in comparison to those who are foolish. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And we know how that ended. Lord, Lord, open up for us. Open up. But he answered, verse 11, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. That doesn't mean I don't recognize you. That means you're not invited. You didn't really accept the invitation. And it was too late. There was no time. John MacArthur says it well. He says, after that time, there is no second chance, no purgatory, no hope. The door is closed. In modern day terms, you can't follow the world and think, well, I'll get it right and ready when he comes. It will be too late. David Platt again, will you be found walking in obedience to Him when He returns? Or will you be wandering in disobedience? Will you be found hating sin or holding on to your sin? Matthew 7.21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And then Christ closes it with this sobering verse. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Let, let me pull this together and then let's seek to apply it. Lift, up us, lift us up off the floor, send us out. If we are to describe what the Bible, what Jesus calls foolish, 
we would say those foolish ones are described as holding on to a profession of faith to follow Christ. Even being part of a community of believers that sits under the preaching of God's Word, that walks with them through this life. Even a belief that Jesus is who He says He is, that He's coming back like He said. But they're not preparing to persevere. Meaning that they're walking in worldliness. They're not following Christ. And therefore, according to this text, are not saved. Some people will look, quote, like the followers of Jesus. They have responded to an invitation, they've made a confession, and they've expressed some affection towards Christ. But they will not endure into the end. What does it mean not to endure? It may be as drastic as just walking away from the faith, saying, I don't believe this anymore. But I think more likely, instead of trimming their lamps, they're trimming their sails. It's Christians who say, you know what, I don't, I don't, I don't want to rock the boat here. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to endure persecution. I'm not really going to make a stand. I'm going to spend my time in what I want to do. Because if you look at the, the difference in comparison, I'm going to use that same formula between the foolish and the wise. The first three are the same. The wise make a profession of faith that honors Christ. They do life with a community of believers. They do believe Jesus is who He said He is and did what He said He was going to do. But they are preparing to persevere. They're hiding God's Word in their heart. They're killing sin. They're daily repenting. They're sharing their faith with Christ, uh, with their, their, their faith in Christ with others. Their faith is growing. When persecution comes, let me say this, hear me. It hurts. I experienced it this way and I had this, this week, and I had not experienced it this way in a long time. With dear friends who kicked back hard against the biblical truth. And I was so taken off guard. So taken off guard and I thought, am I not prepared to persevere? I'm not talking that I had to blast back and win an argument. I'm talking about my knees were so shaky because of the way they responded to a core biblical truth. It caught me by surprise. And I found my longing for their friendship and affection was greater than it should be. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have friends and shouldn't love them, but it was greater than saying, okay, I knew this was coming. I'm going to pray for them all the more. I'm not going to be discouraged. It, it, it knocked the wind out of me. And so don't hear me preaching at you. Hear me preaching with you on this. We've got to be prepared. Jesus says if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Now, we don't have to be offensive. The gospel's offensive enough. But when people take great offense against the gospel and we are the target, we've got to be kind, but we've got to stand upon the rock. And we've got to say, you know what? This, happened, this may happen tomorrow, and it may happen the next day, and it may continue. It's not perseverance if we think it's always going to get better around the corner. The wise are those who are preparing to persevere. In real simple terms, the wise are not distracted when they're packing their bags. Have you noticed that? Those girls were thinking ahead. You know what? This groom could be delayed. I've heard. He warned us it might happen. I'm going to pack a flask. The only way that the foolish didn't pack the flask, if you think about it, is the same way your kids forget to bring the important things that you tell them to because they're distracted with what is pleasing them in the moment. And aren't we just like our kids half the time? Or most of the time? Oh, I forgot this. How did I forget this? Well, there's only one way. I didn't forget what I wanted to remember. And that's what Jesus is saying. Where's your heart? Where's your allegiance? The foolish are foolish because they are willfully foolish. They are distracted by the things of the world. They're doing what they want to do. They brought what they wanted to bring. They did not forget that piece of jewelry that they wanted to wear to the wedding. 
They did not forget the tiara. They didn't forget the dress. They didn't forget the shoes. They didn't forget the stockings. They forgot the oil. Why? Because they were thinking of themselves instead of the groom. And busyness and being preoccupied or delays are not an excuse for what the heart actually follows. Christ has preached this before. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve the groom and yourself. Metro, can we see as a church how having a correct understanding of this will impact everything we do with regards to sanctification? Everything. It will give us a boldness that we wouldn't normally have. Why? Because souls are at stake. It will change how we evangelize, baptize, memorize, even eulogize. It will change everything. Why? Because we don't want to be outside a closed door and we don't want those whom we know and love to be shut out. One commentator sums it so plainly. Make sure you don't miss the party.